So, good afternoon. My name is Alan Clark, um, and my title is, is long, uh, but my history is uh, engineering, uh, and I work in uh, industry, uh, with the uh, industry forums, and we'll talk about that, and uh, I get to work on what I call emerging standards, so new industry standards, and then also open source. Um, and they actually, all three go together. Um, so that's, uh, those are the guys at SUSE are the guys that pay my paycheck. Um, but I'm also the uh, uh, chairman of the board for the OpenStack Foundation, which is uh, really exciting right now. They're the guys that are doing the OpenStack the cloud software. I am also on the board of directors for the Linux Foundation, um, which are the guys that pay Linus Torvald's paycheck. For those of you that know Linux, um, I've been on, I'm on the advisory board for LibreOffice, which is the open source Linux version of, of OpenOffice, and uh, involved with GNOME Foundation and KDE, so I've been all over the place. I, uh, up until a few months ago, I was also the chair for the OpenSUSE uh, project, and I finally had to raise a white flag so I can't do it all. <laughs> I had to give that one up. You think? Yeah, so I still participate in the Open SUSE community, but I just didn't have the bandwidth to deal with, with that as well. So my background is open source, been doing it for several years, and uh, industry, new and in, in emerging technologies in the industry. Um, so involved, like I said, with the latest one is cloud. And so I wanted to talk today about the disruptive nature of, of open source and talk about why, why is it winning? Why is it winning against proprietary implementations? And I'm actually pleased we got people here. I kept thinking, 4 o'clock on a Friday, who's crazy enough to hang around? So I appreciate you showing up. Uh, I'd actually like to have this be a lively discussion rather than just me flipping a bunch of slides. Um, but you're also going to hear it from my perspective uh, with the people I've worked with and I'm going to give you some examples of uh, why things work the way they do and, and just give you some personal insights from that. Um, but I thought it'd be good first to talk about open source, um, make sure we have the same definition because uh, when I travel around and talk to people, they're going, oh yeah, everything's open source. And, but there, there are differences. People have the idea if I just put source code out there on the internet somewhere, that's open source. And then you hear other variations, they call it open core and so forth. But open source, and, and, I, and I'm stressing this point for, for a reason, right? It goes back to why open source is winning. So when I say open source, what comes to your head? What comes to your mind? What source code, source unity, um, okay. you know. Source code, you've got a community around it. Yeah, well, it's like a movement. It's a movement. As opposed to the proprietary software. Okay. It's, uh, okay. Yeah. It's a right. network right. 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 Um, dynamic solution. Cooperation. Okay, cooperation. Okay, what else? It's more network instead of our control. Okay, more network, so it's community. Just individual more of a meritocracy, GPI, right? oh, meritocracy, yeah. exactly. Versus, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Dana, how are you, sir? Hey, Alan. So, well, so so you're hitting on the right topics. So, a couple others that I want to I want to stress is the source code is out there, but the rules around it are such that you have free dis redistribution. Okay. So I, I've seen projects they'll say, oh, we're open source. They put it up there, but they put all these rules up there about how you can and can't use it, or you can't redistribute it, right? Oh, you can if you're doing it for non-commercial purposes, or whatever. We'll put some weird constraints on it. Um, and that's not open source, okay? Um, so, so it's very important that the, uh, you have redistribution capabilities. It's available in source code. You can compile it and redistribute it in both source and compiled form to whomever you want. Um, it's also important to know that there are rights attached to the software, to the source code, right? Um, some of those rights um, are more freely than others, and so those rights are, are described through a license. 
Okay, so the source code out there does have a license associated with it. And um, that license needs to allow for modification. So the license needs to be free enough that I can go in and tinker with the code and modify it. And I can redistribute those modifications, right? And um, also the license has to be that it can't be product specific. And I'll give you a couple examples of those. So, um, I've seen licenses um, where they'll say, you can use this software, uh, let's say it's a uh, scientific software. Well, you can use this software anywhere but in the scientific community. Well, that's not open source, right? That's just some guy trying to get your, your help for him to corner a market. And, and that's not open source. And um, um, so here's an interesting question for you. So there are several different licenses out there. The most... Uh, what are some of them that you've heard? GPL. GPL. Yeah. BSD. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. There's 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 BSD three clause. Yeah. There's all there's all there's all types. So we've got GPL, which is very restrictive, right? As far as you contribute, you, if you modify, you gotta you gotta give your code back. You got BSD, which is um, take and do whatever you want with it. So which license do you think is more prevalent? I see GPL everywhere. So GPL is more prevalent. Which license is, uh, for new projects, which license is more prevalent? Apache. Apache? Apache. Yes. Yep, so Apache BSD. Which is interesting because when this first started, everybody said, oh, you got to do GPL because we've got to make sure everybody contributes all their changes back, right? But as time has gone on, people have realized we don't really need that restriction. It's working um, without having to force people to do it. They don't want to hold the changes through. So, and I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to show you. I'm going to talk about a couple examples of why. So, so it's gotten where you can do a very liberal license, a BSD license, and um, and people still contribute back. So we're going to talk a little, little later here. We'll talk about why. Why are they contributing back? Um, so another antidote here. <laughs> Some of these licenses get a little funky. Um, I remember we ran into one. Uh, so at, at SUSE, I participate on what we call the Open Source Review Board, which is a committee. When a company goes to use open source, they have to you know, have to get the attorneys in the room and they have to decide if, if the uh, company can live with that license. And um, I, I remember we had one, uh, it was actually a BSD license, so it was very liberal, except that the person had thrown a clause in there that says, if you like my source, if you like my source code and uh, you happen to run into me, you have to buy me a beer. <laughs> and um, he, the guy lives in San Francisco, it's pretty funny, but our attorneys were all up in the air going, what are we gonna do? You know, we use this source code, we have to buy this guy a beer if we see him. <laughs> I was like, I think we can live with that. You know? <laughs> uh, or, uh, there was a clause in there that says, if you like it, you know, then you have to. So I said, well, you just tell our guy, our, our employees, just to tell him we didn't like your source code. And we don't have to buy a beer. <laughs> if we're that tight, you know, we can't even buy the guy a beer. But, uh, I've never run into him, so I've never had to buy him a beer, but I, I always thought that was funny. Um, but you do run into, and, and thankfully these are dying away, but um, years ago we used to see a lot of derivatives of these open source licenses where people would throw in clauses about, you know, whatever the political movement was at the time, save the whales or whatever, you know, and they throw in these, these clauses where you got, if you use my code you have to donate to some organization or, or you have to vote for so and so or whatever. And luckily, those are dying away because they're just bad practice. But um, so, I wanted to talk about why we we got to talk a little bit about the world today, and um, why it's uh, why open source works now, where it wouldn't have worked many years ago, a few years ago. Um, and if you think about it, think about the world today. It's highly connected, right? Um, Every, and, and, you know, previous gentleman was talking about cloud and how everything's moving to the cloud. Um, we're very connected. I, it couldn't even, 
everybody's got a cell phone, everybody's got a smartphone, we got all our data, we're Twittering, we're Facebooking, we're just totally interconnected, right? Um, more than ever before. And uh, we just can't live without it. We're just so highly interconnected. Um, but the other thing that's happening is the diversity of devices that we're using, right? We're not all using, uh, if, if you look back to the PC days, right, we had a vendor that was trying to capture the whole desktop market. And the market has just totally dramatically changed where I'll bet, I'll bet almost every one of us have a, has a different uh, smart device that we're using that's not all from the same manufacturer, right? So they're very different devices. In fact, the meeting I was in yesterday uh, in New York, I was there talking to uh, a financial firm, and uh, we were talking about uh, cloud and, and the issues they're, they're, they're fighting with cloud. And um, he's trying to get, well, I won't go into the details of what he's, what he's trying to do, but he's, he's, he's got to deal with connecting all his employees plus um, um, users of, of their services. And he, and he kept telling me, but you don't understand the complexity we have here. And I said, well, okay, so describe it to me. He says, well, first off, we have 1.7 million users. They're expecting a response in less than a second, okay, from, from their web service. So quick response. And he says, but it's not just the one point. And I was going, well, that's not that big a deal. And he's going, but it's the diversity of the devices that they're hitting us with. Right? It's not just that it's 1.7 million people, it's 1.7 million people and they all have 1.7 million different devices that they're, they're hitting them with. And that diversity is, is creating this complex environment for them. So that's pretty interesting. Um, so we're all very connected. But if you think about it, um, the world is very different. So I, I noticed uh, an article earlier this week on uh, um, CERN, uh, it's the 20th anniversary of, of CERN giving away the, uh, what they said, giving away the web. So does, you guys know who uh, Tim Berners-Lee is? He's one of the nicest guys I've ever met. I met Tim before he was actually knighted uh, by the Queen years ago. I, I was part of the uh, World Wide Web Consortium. And uh, um, <laughs> believe it or not, we were back then, we were, were debating um, the whole HTML standard, and uh, um, it was amazing because um, see, back in those days, um, open source wasn't that prevalent, and so there was a lot of battles going on with proprietary protocols. And amazing how how many uh, companies were trying to capture the internet back in those days. Right? It was like early nineties. Yeah, this is early 90s. They were trying to capture the internet and they were trying to capture that protocol because they all realized, can you imagine if we could have controlled the internet? They were trying to follow the Windows business model. They were, but, and then not surprisingly, they were one of the leaders there, right? So, uh, but it didn't happen because um, Tim Berners-Lee had a vision and uh, it was this principle of universality and universal access. And it started back when he was working for CERN we could talk about CERN, that's a cool place. Um, just as a side note, um, I was talking to, uh, so CERN's part of the OpenStack Foundation, and I was talking to uh, Tim Bell, who's their director of IT there, and they run OpenStack. And anyway, he was telling me that when they run that little collider they have over there, <laughs> little collider, that little collider, <laughs> yeah, he says that that thing generates two terabytes of data per second. Two terabytes of data per second, and he has to get that data out to 10,000 researchers around the world. Right? So we're talking a ton of data. So he has to process it. So when he processes it, he says he processes it down to about uh, a third of that, and so a third of ter two terabytes every second, and he's got to get that data out to all these researchers. Um, so back when when Tim Berners Lee started. Um, was CERN, um, he had the same problem. He was trying to get this data out to these professors and universities around the world, and they were discussing how to do it. And that's where the idea of the World Wide Web came about. And 
um, this is back in 1993, and they were discussing with CERN about, okay, how do we do this? And, um, you know, whether CERN should own the, the essentially own the web, or they should make it, um, uh, make it open and make it free. And um, uh, Tim argued that um, it should be, that CERN shouldn't own it, so they shouldn't claim uh, ownership on it, but they should make it open and free. You know, great foresight. And so at that time, uh, his management agreed and they actually created a legal document that says we're opening this up and we don't own it. And that was the beginning of the World Wide Web. So from that little beginning, that started leading us to where we are today, where we've got this universal access. And, and we've been fighting for that this whole time. So I got to work, it's a lot of fun to work with him for a couple of years. Second guy I want to point out, probably all know Linus. Linus is a very interesting guy. I really like Linus, but uh, has a little stronger personality than Tim. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the one thing I wanted to point out here was, it, you've all heard about uh, Linus's famous email that he sent out, right? So in there, though, the, the thing that I wanted to point out, so is we, we've got Tim that's created this World Wide Web, and because he's done that, people now can start to collaborate and along comes Linus, and he sends out this email that says, hey, I'm going to start creating this little operating system. Anybody want to help? Right? I mean, it's as simple as that. He just basically says, it's not going to be anything big. I'm just doing it as a hobby. But does anybody want to help? From that little beginning, look at where we're at today with Linux, right? It was just a total different mindset. I mean, he was trying to... And also because he was trying to work with something called Minix. And it was closed, it was fighting licenses, and he just said, well, I, let's just see if somebody's interested in working together. So a very different mindset. So two things happened. The web became open, and all of a sudden Linus had this idea of, hey, maybe people can collaborate together in an open way. How many years did we have Unix before that? Oh, yeah. 20 or 30 years? And uh, I worked on Linux, and I worked on Unix. Um, so myths, let's talk about myths of open source. A lot of these have gone away, but they're actually pretty, pretty interesting. I run into these all the time. So have you heard of these? I, hear the, I don't hear of these as much as I used to. Um, but, it, you know, open source can't be any good if it's free. So I remember uh, this, this first one I ran into with my neighbor several years ago, and I won't name his name, but he came up to me with this pirated copy of Microsoft Office. And he was saying, could you install this for me? And I said, no, I won't do it, because that's illegal. He's like, oh, come on, it's not a big deal. And I says, no, just go grab open Office and put it on. Really? Well, it can't be any good. And so I said, but I'm not going to install this. And so he went away, and he installed open Office, and he came back, and he goes, hey, that's actually pretty good. But how do you guys make any money? Yeah, you just didn't understand the open source concept. Um, second one, oh, open source, isn't that mean it's not secure? And uh, the third one, well, I'll grab it and use it, but I'm not going to make it, you know, share my changes. And then the fourth one, this one I love, this was actually from the press. And uh, this was, 2003, I remember this one. This one hit big, big time, uh, because we had some proprietary vendors that were really pushing to kill open source, and they were saying, oh, innovation loses if open source wins. And they were touting how all the software engineers were putting ourselves out of a job, and it would all go overseas, and because of open source, there wouldn't be any software development in the United States. Remember hearing any of these? And I loved it because um, this was actually um, um, Tech Week that, that published, they published a big article on this about how there won't be any innovation if we do open source. So have you heard of any other myths from mine? There, well, there's no money in producing. Yeah, there's no money. In producing and running and updating open source. Yeah. Which is pretty Yeah, there's no money in open source. 
That's a good one too. I should have put that one. It was also really difficult to install it and get it going. Oh, it's Logan hard. Yeah, it's, it's hard. It's it's hard to install. And yeah, that's a good one too. Well, I think not so much now, but you know, go back ten years before World Wide Web and forums and Stack Overflow. Open source is really hard to find support for. It. And Unless you can support. find a decent mailing list, but then you might have to wait three months before somebody replies. Yeah. <laughs> but nowadays it's not so bad because you can find mods documentation online. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it's hard to support. Yeah. What was yours? Oh, I was just saying when you mentioned that there's lack of documentation to support, there's a lot of open source business models that are really functional and successful based around. Support. Exactly. Like right of open source. Yeah, and then, so I'm, I'm going to highlight one. Okay. So so those are the myths and and the naysayers the naysayers and so forth. What they were the fud they were passing around. But really, what's the promise that that has come from open source, right? And so I listed six that I wanted to talk about. Um, freedom of choice. You know the technology. Uh, the power of a community, uh, talk about the service that comes around, you know, what's available with it, um, the diversity that comes from open source, and uh, the innovation that happens around open source. And I made myself a couple notes so that I could uh, couldn't forget stuff. <clears throat> so, freedom of choice. Uh, if you if you go out to OSI um, and and look at uh, the definition of open source, they talk about the four freedoms: you know, freedom zero, the freedom three, and the freedom of choice. And this is one of the reasons that open source wins is because I can run the program for any purpose I want. Right? The source code is there for me to do with it what I want. The second one is I can study the program. I can look at the source code and see how it works. And I can change it so that it can do what I want it to do, right? So I can change it as I wish. And as Freedom 1 says, I've got the access to that source code. Freedom 2, I can redistribute it, right? This is why I was stressing this earlier on, on that first slide. Um, and I can distribute those those modified versions to other people. And then by doing that, the whole community benefits from it. Okay? So we've got freedom of choice. That's a very big, a big deal. Um, an example of, of this, look at Linux. Okay? Linux is 21 years old now. And look at the diversity of Linux. It's everywhere. Right? It started out from Linus trying to solve one little problem, and it is everywhere now. Um, it's in your car, it's in your phone, it's in, in your, all your computers, your servers, it's in your modems. Hmm? I was on a flight, and they were loading up the, yeah, um, you're in the, the video service. thing, and it had a little penguin. I was like, yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's in your set-top boxes. Um, it's all over. And it's because people have the freedom to take the source code and do with it what they need, right? Tune it for what they want. Uh, the, 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 the financial guys I was talking about earlier, they love Linux. And it's because they can take and look at it, they tweak it. Those guys are after the milliseconds, right? They're, they're, um, when they're doing uh, the stock exchange guys, right, they're, they're looking to gain every millisecond they can get out of the code. So Every unfair advantage they can get. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a competitive advantage. Um, and uh, so for them to look at the code and, and under, you know, understand how it works so they can tweak it and tune their apps to it is really critical for them. So that freedom of choice has given us the diversity um, that's making it win. So the second one is the power of the community. And when we talk about community, we always think of, well, we got a bunch of geeks getting together and sharing code. But community is actually consistent of more than that, right? You have the developers, but you get administrators involved, 
um, for two reasons. Well, at least two reasons. There's usually more than two reasons. One, they want to understand the code. And so they want to come and see uh, and talk to the developers. And two, they want to know where the developers are going. right? Uh, because in, in, in open source, when you have a community, you have a diversity of people involved. There's really usually no set roadmap. And I've, I've sat in the room with <clears throat> Linus and, and all those guys, uh, Greg and Ted and, and uh, James and all those guys. And, you know, just trying to get a roadmap out of them is just impossible. Uh, but they'll always tell you about the cool thing they're working on. Right? So for them, that's the, that's the roadmap, is the cool thing they're working on. Um, but there's nobody sitting up on top writing all this down saying, okay, here's the roadmap for the next five years. Just get it there. Um, third part of it is the users. Uh, I mentioned uh, Tim from CERN, for example. He heads up the... Uh, users group for, for the OpenStack uh, community. And they're there um, uh, because, again, they want to see what's going on. They want to contribute. Uh, they want to come back and talk to the community and explain how they're using it. Um, so if you're at the, uh, an interesting case, um, we had the OpenStack Summit two weeks ago. We had Best Buy stand up and, and talk about how they're, they're using OpenStack. And um, he, he put up a slide and he says, okay, we really have to have agility, guys. And you, let me show you why. And so he showed the slide, and, you, and I'm sure you've all seen this, right? Um, so he, he talked about their, their web use and, and how consumers and users are coming to their website. And he showed this line, and it was like, you know, the, until you hit, you just kind of bump, 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 until you hit Thanksgiving. And I went ping out of the roof and back down after Christmas. And up, 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 up. So over Thanksgiving, he said they have seven times, on Thanksgiving Day, they have seven times the traffic. Okay? So he's going, guys, I need agility. Okay? So users come to the community to express their needs and explain why they need. Um, another good area uh, is documentation. Uh, we have a lot of writers that are participating in these communities. They have no idea how to write code, but they're very good at writing documentation. And so they come and contribute that. Marketing, uh, marketing types will come and join. And legal, even legal. Uh, we actually have a, a legal team. That they're not legal, uh, they're not hired lawyers. They don't provide advice as far as legal advice as a an attorney for the, the as an attorney for the foundation, but they come in and they'll talk about legal issues um, for open source and, and the communities. And one of the ones that we're talking about right now has to do with intellectual property and the risk uh, that that we have right now in the cloud space. And how are we going to solve that? So we dealt with that issue in the Linux arena, and. Um, so we have those same, similar questions in the cloud space now. How are we going to deal with that? So uh, there's a bunch of uh, lawyers that are very interested in that topic, and so they come and participate. Can you elaborate on what's going on? Yeah. Um, so they're talking about um, what's the right thing to do. And, and in particular, the, the example I'm giving is OpenStack, so intellectual property. How do we deal with that? Um, how do we protect the community? Aren't there already licenses in place? So, yeah, we have the license, but, but license is different than patents. So I'm talking about patents. Wow. Okay, how do we deal with patents <coughs> and trolls, particularly trolls, right? How do you deal with them? And Linux has an answer to that. Uh, they created the Open Invention Network, right? Um, which, we, we go into the history as why, but it has to do with the three-letter company that is out of Utah. Uh, but uh, so you know, the question is: Does OpenStack do the same thing? Do they just use OIN? Do they do something different? And so you really have to analyze what the risk is. You know, who are the potential um, threats? What are the threats? You know, what are they? Uh, and, and so we do some analysis on that, and then based on that, we'll decide what's the appropriate action. 
So, so you're talking like the patented technology of like cloud software? Competitors. So cloud software, right. So the patents are involved with, with the technology within OpenStack and what are the patents that the competitors have that, and how can those be used? Are they with companies that are just purely defensive or are they with trolls that are just looking, waiting for the market to get real red hot and then they'll come and Start exploit it? Yeah, extort. So primary so defensive to avoid anything like that? Not letting anything into that? Into the not allow patents? Is that what you're asking? No, not. I mean, do they just, before they put their license on it, do they make sure nothing in there that is patented? Or, or what's the general strategy well, to protect? Well, you're looking, at, you're looking at technologies and patents that aren't part of the community. So you're looking at what's out there in the open, right? So what if other people patent it? They're not contributing to the community. I'm, I'm not concerned about the patents that are within the community. Right, right. Yep, I'm patents. concerned about the competitors out there that hold patents that could, uh, you know, we could potentially infringe, right? And, and, and they could use to extort on it. So could they potentially go on after the users of an open source software? Like well, that's what that's what they tried about Linux, right? They tried to go after the users, to, mostly to scare them away, right? So they sued DataZone and a couple others, and, and and we've seen that in a few places where they'll go in and just threaten them and say, "Pay us a license, and we won't sue you," kind of thing. And uh, so that's where the Open Invention Network came around, right? Was to say, "Look." Uh, and companies like SUSE put up a, a policy that said, well, any users will indemnify you and we'll cover if there's any type of lawsuits and that kind of stuff. Oh. So what, what do you see as the solution to all of it? I mean, in talking uh, it's a complex people. topic. It really is. Um, when I hear about it, I feel like I just want to start over, but that seems Hard, well, right? so you have to remember that you can't just get rid of the patent system. It's in the Constitution. So you'd have to amend the Constitution to get rid of the patent system. So does the patent system need to change? Yeah, but it's well, not going to go away. Well, the problem with patents is they can cover things that are reverse engineered, right? So even they can patent functionality rather than the source, can't they? Yeah, you're patenting a process, you're not patenting right. a source code. So itself. even if you take that process, no matter how you dress it up and make it your own, right. and you write it from the ground up, right. you can still run into patent. Yeah, right. Some of these things are just dreams that are patented. You don't actually before, have to implement the Before code. they, you know, they're even the capability to do anything by decades. Yep. Right. Well, it, if you, well, were, if you, you can't, it, you can't say, we're getting off topic here, but I, I can't right. say, okay, I'm going to, uh, patent the transporter, right? You actually have to show a method that says, here's how I would do it. Doesn't mean I have to implement it, but I actually have to prove that I can do it. So a, not me personally, but that a, an expert can actually do it. Right? So I can't create some mythical idea and say I can beam myself to Saturn and patent that without proving that I can actually do it. So. Prior to the 90s, there were only two software patents. They were in conjunction with hardware. It wasn't until they opened a gate for the software patents that any of this problem existed. If you looked at the law the way it was before then, we wouldn't have any of those things. Yeah. So, like I said, I think there needs to be reform. So let's move on here. Um, so, one of the things you'll find about open source communities, and these vary, um, is they'll always have a set of principles. The guide them. and um, and this is actually why I'm, I'm actually going to sit on a panel in ten days back in New York um, with the other cloud projects and, and the uh, the organization that set up this panel is actually trying to make it look like the open source projects are all competitors. We're competing against each other, and I'm actually looking at it going, no, we're really not. And um, because with open source, the projects set up these principles, and everybody's principles, well, they're very similar, but they're, they're always a little bit different, and that 
difference actually differentiates them, and you'll find that these projects will always head in a little bit different direction. Some will focus more, for example, OpenStack you'll find is, is focusing more on um, enterprises and uh, business. And some of these other communities are, or open source projects are, are being more community focused and hobby focused and so forth. And so you'll see that their feature sets and stuff will diverge, but it's based on these principles. Um, but uh, so these are the principles that, that OpenStack put together when we created the foundation last September. And first off, we said everything would be open source, it's not going to be mixed. So we're not going to have anybody come along and say, can I put my little binary piece in there, right, and ship it with it. Ain't going to happen. It's an open development model, uh, so which means that everything is out in the open and transparent. And all these things you were naming earlier, the meritocracy, uh, you know, uh, anybody can come and, and and develop. So all code is freely available, it's all out there in the open on GitHub. Uh, we pick the Apache license. Uh, other projects will pick different licenses. GPL, for example, the Linux kernel is all GPL too, and forever will be. <laughs> um, that's one thing about when you pick a license, um, changing it after it is just impossible, right? They keep having discussions and there's a lot of pressure on the Linux kernel guys to go to GPL3. And the answer is you really can't because everybody can, that contributes, contributes to that license. Okay? And so now to change the Linux kernel, you've got 20 years of contributions. You've got to go back and find all those contributors and get them to agree to change their contribution to a GPL3 license. You're not going to be able to find half those guys anymore. Right, so, so it just doesn't happen. Um, the other project principle that the OpenStack goes under is the open design process, and um, which is why we have our, our summits every six months. And so, in the, the design model is that we start a new release, a new release every six months, and uh, a couple weeks before we start the release. Uh, we actually hold elections, so each of the components, uh, the compute mo uh, component, the network component, the identity component, and so forth, those are all broken up into separate projects, and each project has a project leader. And every six months, we elect a new project leader. Now, it turns out that a lot of those just get re-elected. The point is, is that it's open, and that any of person that contributes code can be can vote and or choose to run to be the project lead. Um, so that so every six months we, we elect our project leaders, which is part of our open development model, and then they get together and set up what we call blueprints, um, which is basically think of it as the feature set that we're going to work on for the next six months. And then they sit in the summits. Um, and prioritize those and figure out you know, which ones they are most important, we'll give them a, a priority of high, medium, or low, and kind of get a, a feature set that they're going to work on for the next six months and who's going to contribute and so forth. So we write, write all those down and, and, and then uh, they work in an open way. So all their meetings are on IRC and all the communications are done either on open mailing lists or IRC or so forth. Uh, they don't have any closed meetings. Uh, so it's very much an open design process. And then the, uh, the last principle um, that we have is an open community. And there's actually been a little criticism on this one um, because some people are claiming you guys are too open. Because anybody can join and be a member of the OpenStack Foundation. Um, there's no requirement there, right? And some people are now complaining, saying, well, you really should make some requirements. And, and uh, I actually disagree. I think that that's one of the uh, positive things about OpenStack is that we're extremely open, that anybody can come and join and be a member or participate. And it goes back to 
this list here, right? It's not because you know I've had people say, well, we shouldn't let them join until they've contributed code, and I'm going. But the community is made up of more than people just writing code. The guys, and the legal guys are never going to provide any code, but they're having great discussions for us around IP. What about the documentation? Right? They're not writing code. They're looking at it, but they're not writing code. So all these people contribute in different ways, trying to come up with rules about you know whether they they should be part of the community or not is just fraught with peril. And uh, so we're completely open. Thoughts, questions on that? If I just keep rambling on. Can chatbots right. be part of the community? Can what? Can chatbots be part of the community? Chatbots? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, no, that's, you know, you're actually making them, yeah, we have to watch for those. <laughs> now, the criticism comes because um, in OpenStack, we, we set up a board of directors and we set up the, the technical committee. And uh, the board of directors, several community seats on the, on the board of directors. And um, so it's the open community that elects um, those seats. And there's been criticism saying, oh, we have people joining the community just so they can vote to get their favorite friend on, on the board. And I, so we've had some arguments back and forth about whether that's true or not. And I don't believe it's true. I don't think there's that much influence that they could exert on the elections to, to make that happen. But that's where the arguments are coming from. Um, so I wanted to give a couple examples here. So as you look at OpenStack, and this is the other the other thing um, that I want to talk about here. So right now, in fact, that number is probably off. We're up over 9,000 members. Okay, so this project is two years old, not even quite two years old started out with nine people and we're up over 9,000. We as I mentioned, we just had our summit in Portland. Um, well, in fact, I'll, I'll step back a couple. So a year ago, April, we had the summit in San Francisco and we had 1,100 people show up. And everybody, all the critics came out and said, well, that's just because you held it in Silicon Valley and people didn't have anything else to do, so they showed up free food. And then we're like, well, okay, whatever. So then we, in last fall, we held it in San Diego. And uh, San Diego, we ended up having over 1,300 people show up. And we were planning on 1,000. And we cut off the registration and you said, we can't handle it anymore. You know, caterers really don't like it when you have more people show up than what you paid for. Um, so we cut it up, registration off of 1,000. We had 300 people show up on opening day that hadn't even registered. <laughs> they just showed up. <laughs> and Jonathan just said, what do we do? And I said, I think we should let them in. He said, yeah, I do too. So we let everybody in. So we had, we had over 1,300. So for this one in April, and we had two weeks ago, we were planning on 1,800. And ended up, I haven't seen the final count, but I, I Anywhere between, uh, it's probably come out. I've just been on the road and I haven't seen the final count, but uh, we just keep growing and growing and growing. Um, you just get this momentum, right, that's rolling with it. And um, people are very interested. They want to hear what's going on and they want to participate. And they want to participate with their expertise. Uh, and the interesting phenomenon here is um, the strength worldwide. Uh, I was in China last fall and huge, huge interest in their contributing, um, which is another reason why you have to be so open uh, and why we pick a uh, medium like IRC instead of trying to do phone calls. Phone calls are horrendous when they've got mixed languages around the world. Um, but when you get it in a written form like IRC, um, people feel much more at ease in trying to contribute. Um, so this last release, we, we had over 500 people contribute code. Uh, 
Um, so the history of the project, we've had over 800, so 500 of those have been within the last six months that have contributed on code. And we have corporate sponsors. So the last count, uh, we have over, over 150 corporate sponsors. All right, so these are businesses contributing, if not money, people and time. So there's, there's money in open source, right? When people say, well, I can't make any money, um, that's a falsehood. So Grizzly, so again, we go on these six month stints, and, I, and I'm just trying to give you examples here. I'm not, um, but Grizzly, they had 230 blueprints completed. It was over 230 um, in six month cycle, okay? 3,200 patches, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. Um, that's just in six months, right? Yeah, that's just six months. So just to give you a comparison, um, Linux actually still is, is larger. So Linux, they, they can get upwards of 10,000 patches. And so they're still bigger. Um, but their feature set is actually smaller. So if you, if you call them blueprints, the number of blueprints, this is a little lower than this, but the number of patches have been quite higher. So an interesting side note here. Um, I, you know, um, so I'm, I'm just trying to give you a feel for the momentum. Okay. So then the question comes up, and I tried to raise this earlier. So why don't people just take, where it's open source, and you get like a, a, an Apache license or a BSD license, why don't they just grab the code and use it? Licenses, I can use it anywhere I want. I don't have to contribute back. So what prevents a company from grabbing that source code and saying, I have this great idea, I'm going to make it proprietary. I'll just grab this and use it as my base to start code. Didn't they own it for life? It's kind of like breaking that chain. You yeah. Know, if, you, if you own it, then if, whereas you can get free support, free maintenance, you know, from, from the new college grads and yeah. so on. So, so let, me give you, let me give you a couple of history, examples from history, yeah. What's that? I'm going to add that nothing actually does stop them from doing it, but it, but it doesn't hurt the rest of the community who's still working on it yeah. as well. It doesn't, it doesn't, there's nothing that stops them, but there is. And, and, I'll, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, Google, a couple of years ago, said they were real busy, so they forked Linux, essentially took a snapshot of it because they were trying to get uh, the Chrome OS out and said, okay, we're going to fork right now. We'll, we'll contribute it later. And because uh, we're just so busy, right? We've got to get our release out. They had pressure on it and they went off and there were some things that Linux didn't have at that time that they said they really needed. And uh, we had some fun meetings after that. So they actually forked and went off and took a snapshot of, of Linux at that time. They got the release out, got it out quickly, but Linux was advancing rapidly, right? So they fork off, they come back two years later and realize, oh crap, Linux has changed dramatically. Now what do we do, right? So we had a ton of meetings where they sat there and tried to figure out, well actually it wasn't two years, it was only about six months. They had a ton of meetings, it was about a year. They had a ton of meetings to try to figure out how we'd merge these changes back in. Because in the meantime, the Linux community had started to develop those same features, okay, and others. So Google found themselves sitting over here on a dead end fork that they had created. The Linux community was traveling on, and all of a sudden, they got this dead end that they got to figure out how to get back in the mainstream. It took them a couple of years to do that. Um, another example, and I didn't bring my phone today, but if you pick up your phones, the, the embedded world, uh, and if you look at the Linux Foundation, they've gained probably 30 or 40 members over the last two years, and it's the embedded guys. Um, the smartphone guys have this idea that, hey, we're going to grab snapshots from Linux, and we put it in our phone, and we, you know, we'll just Every time we create a new phone, we'll just grab a new snapshot and we'll go off and we'll fork it, um, do our stuff to it, and put it in the phone. And so they were working on this model that every time they would 
develop a new phone, they would just go get a new snapshot and start from scratch. So they end up throwing away everything they did and grabbing a new release. And they realized, they're throwing away a ton of work. So they do all this work to put it in their phone and throw it away to start over. They finally came to the realization that's kind of a dumb business model. So now they're trying to work, and you're seeing much more contributions coming from those guys back into the main line because they're finding it's just too expensive to try to just take a snapshot and maintain that on your own. So it's this momentum that's driving people to stay in with, open, in with uh, the open source community. The other thing that's driving them is we talked about the, the uh, one of the uh, four freedoms allows me to go off and scratch my itch, right? Do my own thing. Uh, and this panel I was sitting on yesterday, um, I was, uh, well, I better not give the name of the company. Um, in fact, I can't give, I'll give, I won't give the name of the two companies he was talking about. So his, I won't give you the name of his company. But we're talking about uh, open source and proprietary. And he said, you know, all our new innovation goes to open source first. He says the proprietary guys, uh, they're a hardware company. So they do high speed um, networking devices and high speed storage is, is their, their focus of their company. And he says, we're doing all our innovation <coughs> on Linux because we can get it in there rapidly. He says, the, the proprietary guys, it takes us at least two years, right? Because we have to go to them and demonstrate our need convince them that it's in their business need to, to get this feature in, and then we have to go through their product cycle to get the feature out. So he says it takes us about two years to get the feature set in there, where open source is moving so rapidly, they just put a guy on it, work on a feature, and in six months it's out, right? They scratch their own image. Um, that's tough to compete with. If you're a private company, that's tough to, tough to compete with. So. Competing with 800 developers, that's tough to compete with, right? So it's this momentum. If you get these open source projects, they get rolling, it is really tough to compete with. Right? Yeah, the other thing is it's not just 850 developers, it's 850 developers that want to be there and contribute versus yeah. just getting a paycheck. Yeah, you're exactly right. Exactly right. But it's not just those projects itself. There's, there's this thing I call the ripple effect. You know, um, this is actually a little lake called Stella Lake. You know, you've all seen a, a, these lakes when they're just mirror smooth, right? When you throw a stone in there, what happens? It creates this ripple. And you just see it spread across until it goes from shore to shore, right? So you have this ripple effect. So a project like OpenStack. They'll go and create a release every six months, and they've got all these developers and all this community around it. But what you'll find is there's other communities that come along and pick up that release. So OpenStack, for example, um, this is a process diagram from, from the OpenSUSE community. And they, they go along and, for example, they, they pick up Grizzly, and then their community starts to work on it. Tune it tested for their environment. So the OpenSUSE community picks up the Grizzly release, tests it on SUSE, OpenSUSE and SUSE, uh, running their specific tests, running it for you know that particular environment, their architecture. So they're working on ARM and they're working, you know, the X86 and so forth. So their architectures, their operating system, and so forth. So they're doing all that additional testing. So it's not just the 850 developers and it's not just the 9,000 community members of OpenStack. It's the other communities that are all working on it as well. And so they go ahead and, and all the changes, you know, and, and, and bugs and everything, they find they, they feed those back to those communities. So you get that ripple effect. So if you start to think about it, you've got all these different open source communities out there and they're all intertwined, twined, right? We always think of Linux, but to run Linux, you've got KDE or got GNOME, right? And it's just mind-boggling, and all these come together. Proprietary company, that's tough to beat. So you've got the power of not just one community, but multiple behind you. Yeah. Well, that's all fun and good with like big projects like you know, Linux Foundation and you know, even OpenStack. You know, OpenStack has like Rackspace behind them. Yeah. So right, a lot of 
I think had a lot of ability to create momentum. Right? Yep. I, I, I'm thinking for like smaller startup places that want to release something that want to do something part of the open source community. But it seems like they may have a legitimate fear there. Well, some they can come up with this great idea, release it as open source. Someone yeah. could a little more easily hijack for what they have and leave them in the dust. You know what I mean? Well, you, so you clearly have to have your business model, but it doesn't mean you have to be big, okay? So look at, look at OpenStack. Uh, most of, not most, a large number of companies involved in OpenStack are um, brand new companies. They're you know, still um, under VC money, right? They're getting venture capital as an open source company and they just they, they focus on a particular area and they drive their so you'll find all these companies come in but they all have their, their niche that they're focused on so Red Hat and uh, uh, Canonical SUSE for example we all contribute to Linux but you know we're all com competitors but we all have a little different focus. And so what you'll find is you don't necessarily have to be big, you just have to have your focus and be able to compete with that focus. Okay? Um, I've got a question. Yeah, we're kind of related to that. Um, how does how does OpenStack kind of interface with the you know the main VMware, for example, they've got yeah. So you'll notice that uh, if you go out there and look, you'll find that, and this was actually a very interesting discussion we had as a board. So in the bylaws, um, we actually limited the number of gold members that could join for the next couple of years because we knew we'd get over the VMware was one of the first ones to come and join the OpenStack Foundation as a gold member. And, and we had some people who were very vocal, like, whoa, what are you doing? You're letting the giant join. They're just going to come and steal our secrets and we're going, we're open and transparent. We're not going to steal anything. <laughs> and you ask yourself, why would they join? Microsoft is, is contributing to OpenStack. Microsoft is contributing to Linux. Why would they do that? They're competitors, right? And the answer is, uh, and this became very clear again from our, uh, I can give you a ton of examples. Um, it's because you're not going to find a business that will focus and they don't want to go, they don't want to be tied to a single vendor anymore. So you're not going to see somebody that says, I'm a pure X shop. I'm not going to name a company, right? They just don't do that. So the VMWares in the world realize it's going to be a heterogeneous data set, right? When you talk about cloud, you're not just going to find VMware, you're going to find OpenStack and VMware. And you're going to find Microsoft Azure and so forth. So we darn well better work well together, is the answer. And they realized that. So Balmer tried to fight it off, and they realized we got to work well together. So Microsoft is doing the same thing. They have to run the links. And so they're there. They're contributing. They've got their niche. They're going to they're going to push VMware, but they're going to say we're going to operate with, with open stuff. All right, we got to hurry here. So what I wanted to point out was exactly what we're talking about is you'll find these companies have their focus. So all those companies are coming together and they're contributing, but they all have their focus. So SUSE, I just I picked SUSE because that's who I work for. SUSE has his focus, right? And, and this is what they focus on. And so they, they, they have their particular focus. And they have their particular markets that they're focusing on, right? Um, you'll find, for example, SUSE is focused on, on the mainframe market. So if you go looking for Linux on the mainframe, you're going to find over 80% of them are running SUSE because they focused on that market. The others, even though we collaborate with competitors, but they focused on their different areas of the market. Um, Linux uh, in retail market, 70% of the market is, is going to SUSE, for example. Um, but part, the other reason I put up this slide is just give you an idea of you're finding open source everywhere, right? Automotive, retail, aerospace, even your, uh, um, you go in to get an MRI, that machine's running Linux. And uh, we could go on. It's pretty cool stuff coming down the pipe. Uh, 
the places where you wouldn't even dream of are, are running links. And um, just the last one, I grabbed this slide from IDC, just to give you, leave you with the notion that it's growing, and it's growing by leaps and bounds, right? So projections out there, look at the size of proprietary stuff, uh, and even Unix, I was dying, but Linux is just skyrocketing. So those are dollar numbers? Or Markets, uh, the market share. So number of units of deployments or what? Deployments or market share. Oh, market share. Yeah, market so share. deployments, yeah. Oh, 70 percent. Well, he's probably basing it. No, I think he's basing it off of deployment numbers. All right, so questions. Dan, I can say how much of that Unix loss is directly converted to Linux? Because I think there's a tremendous amount of that use. Yeah, it most, 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 of, it, most of it is going to Unix, or excuse me, going to Linux. Um, and that's even talking to the Oracle guys um, and IBM. So on the board of directors for Linux Foundation, I've got Oracle and IBM, HP. Um, they're all bad and their losses to Linux. So how do you measure, uh, when you take out downloads, the IDC he have licenses? He, he's, he, the IDC guys go talk and survey uh, enterprises. And they ask them, okay, your deployments, what are you deploying, what are you retiring? And they're pulling the numbers from them. So they're not coming back to the SUSE and asking the question. Okay. They're going to the, the companies that are deploying. That's, that's not talking home desktop or anything no, like that? No, that's that's just that number's not desktops. Yeah, we, um, I have charts on that, but I didn't bring them. It's really hard to measure some of the support. It, it really is, and, and I get hit with that on OpenStack a lot, because um, they're saying, well, you know, how many deployments does OpenStack have? And that's a hard number for two reasons. One, you can't just count downloads. You can always talk down to that. But that's only a fraction, right? Um, companies, well, those 148 companies, they're distributing OpenStack. Right? People aren't getting it from downloads, they're getting it from those 148 companies. And so you gotta go ask those 148 companies to get their numbers. And quite honestly, most of them won't give you their numbers because they consider that competitive advantage. They don't want to tell the competitors how many they're shipping. So it's actually a hard number to come up with. Okay. I'm not sure if everyone would be interested, but you mentioned BSD was almost completely open, but what would be the difference or downside? We're talking the BSD license. BSD license, yeah, yeah, that's right. But what would be the difference of just sticking something out there with no license? Just say it's free here, copy this. Well, so the answer is you have to give it. So everything you do essentially has a copyright. So you have to, you have to declare some type of copyright. Uh -huh. And when you declare a copyright, you essentially have to declare some type of license. Right? I give you the right, when I say I give you the rights to this. So in other words, if you don't do it, it will be copyrighted and no one can do it? Yeah, the default is all rights reserved. Yeah, all rights reserved. Oh, so you've got, got to give, the you've got to give rights, and then the license is to describe those rights. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and just as a side note, I strongly don't go off and create your own license or your own copyright. And the reason is, <clears throat> Corporations have a real tough time adopting it because everything has to get reviewed by the lawyers. And it's very easy if you go in and say, we're just using a GPL license, they'll go, oh, okay, we know that, we understand it, checkbox, you're done. If you say it's Alan Clark's <coughs> license, they go, okay, now we gotta go review it and, and see what you put in there. And as an engineer manager, we hate that, right? Because we don't want to get the lawyers involved because we take forever and like to nitpick everything. So pick a standard license that's going to come for that reason. Other questions? It's, you know, it's really probably gone further faster than even some of the strongest advocates could have envisioned. It has. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about we didn't is that email from Linus to now took 20 years. It works on how you're seeing you know, uh, Linux distributed in so many different ways around the world. So if you look at that curve, if you map that same 
expansion and distribution model with OpenStack, for example, it's exponentially different. And it's because everybody knows open source now and understands it and they're not afraid of it. The Linux had to fight all those battles. The open source, new open source projects today aren't having to. So it's much faster for that. All right. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.